AQA, A-Level Physics, and this is my second video on capacitance. And um, we're going to get this lot done in this video. Quite a lot. Big video. Okay. Now, look at this circuit. Study this circuit. What's going on here? We've got a power supply. Uh, the switch is closed. Uh, we have a capacitor which is in parallel with the power supply. We have a resistor, which is in parallel with the capacitor and the power supply. Now, so the switch has been closed for ages. So basically the capacitor will be fully charged. Okay, it's because it's got a power supply across it. So that capacitor will be fully charged. And in that branch of the circuit, there won't be any current, yes? Remember, if you've got parallel branches, you can look at each branch individually. And in this particular branch, we've got a charged up capacitor. In this bottom branch, well, uh, there will be a steady current. There'll be a current flowing through the resistor because it's got this power supply across it. And a steady current will flow through the resistor and that current will be V over R. Oh, yeah, the, the voltage across it divided by the resistance through it. So a charged up capacitor, a resistor with a steady current flowing through it. Now, what will happen when we open the switch? Well, we op when we open the switch, basically that lot disappears and we've just got the bottom half of the circuit. And what will happen will be that the capacitor will discharge through the resistor. So the capacitor will lose its charge and its charge will go through the resistor. Uh, and as the capacitor loses its charge, the voltage across the capacitor will fall and Q and V will both fall exponentially. Uh, I'm going to have to talk a lot about exponential functions, maybe a bit later. So as it loses charge, the voltage across the capacitor will fall exponentially. What about the resistor? Well, uh, the voltage across the resistor will also fall exponentially. It's in parallel with the capacitor and the current through the resistor will fall exponentially as well. So basically everything falls exponentially, not at a steady rate. It's a little bit like if you imagine having a, a, a bucket full of water. Yeah, there's a bucket full of water and you put a hole in it and the water comes out of the bucket. Now, does the water come out at a steady rate? No, it comes out quickly and then the rate of flow of water gets less and less and less. Yeah, the, the depth of water, the amount of water left in the bucket, it will fall exponentially as well. So here's the equation for an exponential decay. Q is the charge on the capacitor at any particular time. Q naught is the amount of charge on the capacitor at the beginning at time t equals naught. And then this e to the minus T over RC. You should be doing A level maths if you're doing A level physics and you should understand what E is. I think it's very useful to, to remember that this term here is the fraction that remains. If you multiplied it by 100, it would tell you the percentage that remains. So this E to the minus T over RC will start at 1 at the beginning. And then eventually, after a long period of time, it will get to zero. It's the fraction that remains. How much is left? Uh, notice that it depends on the resistance of the circuit and it depends on the capacitance of the capacitor. It depends on R and C. So Q equals Q naught E to the minus T over RC. You should be able to do these questions now. Have a go, and I'll show you the answer in three, two, one. Okay, so the first thing, the charge on the fully charged capacitor, that's just Q equals CV. The initial discharge current, well, that will just be V over R. So I equals V over R, yeah? Because V 
to start with will be 10. So the initial discharge current will be I equals V over R. The charge remaining on the capacitor after 10 seconds, well, we use our equation Q equals Q naught E to the minus T over RC. And hopefully you can work out uh, the charge remaining after 10 seconds. The time it will take for 10% of the charge to remain. Uh, I'll talk about that one. Basically, we've got Q equals uh, Q naught times E to the minus T over RC. And if I'm saying the time it takes for 10% to remain, uh, we're after T, the time, and we want the time when Q over Q naught, if I bring Q naught down there and I get rid of that, if that equals 0 0.1, because that's when 10% remains, isn't it? So 0 0.1 equals e to the minus t over rc. How do you get t from that? You take logs of both sides. Okay, it's all I'm going to tell you. Take logs of both sides. Now, this magic thing here, e to the minus t over rc, that is the fraction that remains. Whether we're talking about the charge on the capacitor, or the voltage across the capacitor, or the voltage across the resistor, or the current through the resistor, I can use this e to the minus t over rc. It applies to all of these quantities. And capacitors are often used in circuits where time is involved. Okay, that's the whole point of these circuits with capacitors. For example, in computers, there's a thing called a clock circuit. You know, everything has to happen at the right time and all together. Uh, a timer circuit, like a very simple version, would be like an egg timer, maybe. Uh, flashing lights, yeah, that's a circuit called an A stable. And, and that circuit has a capacitor in it, okay? Where time is involved, you'll always find a capacitor charging or discharging. Consider this, this particular isotope has a half-life of 470 years. Is that a useful thing to know, the half-life? Well, it is because it gives you an idea of how long this thing is going to last. I mean, is it still going to be radioactive after a couple of years? Absolutely. It's going to take a long, long time to decay. And there is a similar thing for capacitors, which is called the time constant. The time constant. Now, it's not exactly the half-life. It's actually the time it takes for the charge to fall to 37%. So it's the 37% life, if you like, is the time constant. And again, it gives you an idea of how long it's going to take. Uh, RC, that's how we work it out. The resistance times the capacitance. RC is the time constant. So this circuit has a time constant of 47 seconds. Uh, will the capacitor be fully discharged after 10 seconds? No. Will it be fully discharged after 10 minutes? Well, there won't be a great deal left. OK, so the time constant is a useful thing to know, and it equals RC, resistance times capacitance. The equation that you need to know, the one which is on the data sheet, is this one here. OK, which is basically log 2, natural log of 2, which is 0 0.69. Uh, times the time constant is the half-life. So if you want to get the, the time constant, I mean, don't worry about the 37%. Get, it, get the half-life of the decay off the graph and then divide it by log 2, and that will tell you the time constant. Okay? And on, on all this stuff, if you want to read through it, I'm just basically deriving that. Okay? So if T half is the time it takes for Q or V or whatever to halve, then from that, you can get the time constant. Why do you want to get the time constant? Well, one reason might be to work out a capacitance, an unknown capacitance. 
Read this question, have a go at it. A capacitor is charged to 10 volts, then discharged through a 50K resistor. Use the data above to estimate the capacitance. So, well, from the graph, I've got the half-life because it's the time it takes to get from 10 to five. Yeah, 10 volts to five volts. The half-life is 2.6 seconds. So my time constant is 2.6 divided by log two, which is 3.75 seconds. And if to divide that by the resistance, I've got the capacitance, 75 microfarads. Something you should know, uh, another way of getting an unknown capacitance. This is actually a required practical. Now you can get it from the first graph by getting the, the half-life and then dividing by log two. Or what you can do is if you've got values of V and time, you can plot a graph of log V, the natural log of V against time, and it should be a straight line. And the gradient of this straight line should be minus one over RC. That should be the gradient of the line. Why? Well, look at this little derivation here. And basically you fiddle about with it and then you take logs uh, and you end up with something that looks very, very much like Y equals MX plus C. Okay, Y is log V. Yes, uh, my intercept is log V naught. Uh, X is the time and my gradient will be one over RC. So that's another way of finding an unknown capacitance or another way of finding the time constant is you do it from a log graph, natural log graph. And so have a go at this. I've given you the data to get the gradient. I'll show you the answer in three, two, one. And there you go. Now, so far, I've just talked about discharging. What about charging? Okay, if you look at these two buckets here, this, this bucket at the top is discharging. This is like a discharging capacitor. Uh, this bucket at the bottom is a charging capacitor. And how will the amount of water in that bucket vary with time? Well, this graph is discharging and this graph is charging. So it charges up quickly to start with, but then as more and more charge goes on the capacitor and it gets harder and harder to take any more, then it, the graph levels off and it reaches a limit. So Q against time is this graph at the bottom here. It, it's not an exponential growth. It is an exponential function, but it's not an exponential growth. Yeah, so Q against time for the capacitor is this shape here. Uh, so the voltage across the capacitor is the same shape because Q equals CV. The voltage across the resistor, that will still decay exponentially. And the current through the resistor will still decay exponentially as well. Okay, now, uh, another couple of relationships so this is the equation here and this is for a charging capacitor and it's similar to the discharging equation notice the difference between them q equals q naught into one minus e to the minus t over rc and then finally uh, if q uh, against time looks like that the gradient at any point now you should remember that i if if it's a steady current then i equals q over t but this isn't a steady current so i doesn't equal q over t the instantaneous current is dq dt and that is the gradient of the graph so at any point in time the gradient of this graph tells us the current and so if I equals dq dt, then q is going to be the integral of i with respect to time. And that basically means it's the area 
under the graph. If we've got a graph of I against time, current against time, then the area under the graph tells us the charge. Okay. I don't know why that didn't come, come up straight. This crazy PowerPoint, weird ghosts involved. And there's the equation again.